This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 31, Carrigan Rutherford. When six-year-old Carrigan Rutherford was found dead of unknown causes in her family's rented home in Montgomery, Illinois, on July 2, 2020, neighbors spoke up about the abuse and neglect they had witnessed taking place within the family. As it turned out, several people had made reports to police and to DCFS about the way Courtney and James Davidson treated Kerrigan and her younger sister. After an autopsy and toxicology tests revealed Kerrigan's death was caused by an overdose of her mother's antipsychotic medication, the girl's mother and stepfather were arrested. This is the tragic story of Kerrigan Rutherford. My sources for this week are the Kendall County Sheriff's Office, the Kendall County Coroner, Illinois Department of Corrections, Patch, Dunn Family Funeral Home with Crematory, MIA, Medline Plus, GoFundMe, WCSJ News, CBS2 Chicago, News Tribune, Kendall County Now, Lilly Pharmaceutical Company website, Crime Online, Chicago Tribune, Her Name is Kerrigan Rutherford Facebook Group, and Justice for Carrie Facebook Group. Before I tell this very sad story, I first want to apologize for not making an episode last week. I came down with a cold and lost my voice for a little while. One of my sons and I were tested for COVID, and I'm very thankful to report the results were negative. It was a scary few days, though. I'm a little bummed that losing my voice caused me to break a streak of 30 weekly episodes, but hey, I'm only human. I'm going to do my best with this episode, but I'm sorry in advance if I get a little hoarse. One more thing before I jump into the episode. My post on Suffer the Little Children blog last week about Kerrigan caused some major drama in the two Facebook groups dedicated to her and on the blog's Facebook page. It seems there are a few people who have their minds made up about what happened in this case, and when I made an alternative suggestion in my post, these people were inexplicably livid. Whenever I tell a child's story, either on the blog or the podcast, the most important thing to me is honoring the child, giving her a voice, and keeping her memory alive. However, the truth is also important to me, so I try to report all of the facts I've gathered, whether or not they're favorable to certain people. I also include bits and pieces of information I've found in various places, including family members' public social media posts, which sometimes help to paint a more comprehensive picture of the story. Sometimes I speculate on the causes or reasons for certain facts or behaviors or criminal charges. It's all part and parcel of what I do, and I've never gotten a reaction yet like the one I've gotten about this case. To say I was taken aback is putting it lightly. They even tried accusing me of victim blaming, which you guys know I would never do in a million years, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's get into Kerrigan's story. When a six-year-old child dies of unknown causes, it's a tragedy that upends everything we hold to be true. A parent should never outlive a child. It's against every instinct we possess. When a parent is later found to be the cause of their child's death, that tragedy is compounded with anger. The public wants someone to blame. We wonder why no one acted sooner to save the child. We demand to know how no one knew something was going on. Where were the neighbors, other family members, children's services in particular? When we find out that others did know something was going on and reported it, but the agencies and authorities tasked with protecting children are the ones who failed her, the anger turns to outrage. Such is the case with the death of Carrie Rutherford. 
Kerrigan Michael Rutherford was born on February 17, 2014, to then 26-year-old Courtney Ann Rutherford and 27-year-old Paul Sosralski, who has been in and out of jail since a 2009 burglary conviction. Paul is currently on parole from his most recent prison term and was reportedly not a part of Carrie's life. According to Courtney's mother, Sue, in a Facebook post, when Carrie was born, Courtney remained in the hospital for seven weeks, part of that time spent on life support, although the reason for her hospitalization is unclear. In her post, Sue said she struggled to be a grandmother because just three weeks before Carrie was born, Sue's husband, Mike Rutherford, had passed away. Sue and Mike had three children together, Courtney, her sister Tricia, and their brother, who I'll call C.R. because he may still be a minor. Regarding her sister's hospitalization, Trisha wrote on Facebook on March 17, 2014, Courtney Rutherford was transferred to a rehab facility in Sycamore for the last stop on her I Was Really Sick and Almost Died tour. They'll be working on getting her strength back so she can come home. I can tell she's feeling better because she was joking around with me and her nurse today. Woohoo, progress. Months after Carrie's birth, Courtney began dating her future husband, James Allen Davidson. The couple was married in 2015, and Courtney gave birth to a second daughter in October of 2016, who I'll call J.D. My blog post originally mentioned that James may have served in the military, but I have since been informed that although he participated in the ROTC program, James was unable to pass the required IQ and psychological tests to enter the military, as well as law enforcement and the fire department. That did not, however, stop him from posting photos of himself on Facebook wearing a military uniform. On Courtney's Facebook page, she stated on October 26, 2018, that she became a stay-at-home parent, referring to herself as mother, wife, sister, daughter, cousin, niece. Prior to that, her employer was listed as Wendy's. For his part, James noted on Facebook that he began a job as a customer service representative at U-Haul on December 6, 2016. Before that, he worked as a stalker at Walmart and then a crewman at Taco Bell. In 2019, the family moved into a rental house at 128 Boulder Hill Pass in Montgomery, Illinois, after their rental lease at their previous home was not renewed. The owners of the previous house reportedly declined to renew their lease because they vandalized our home with filth and damage and roaches. This was a pattern the Davidsons would not be shy about repeating. Now let's jump ahead to July 2, 2020. At 1.28 p.m., the deputies from the Kendall County Sheriff's Office and members of the Oswego Fire Department responded to the Davidson home on a call of a... That's a six-year-old female, not, possibly not breathing, leaving from the nose, turning different colors. Upon arrival, they found six-year-old Carrie dead inside the rental house. Investigators said it appeared Carrie had been dead for some time. Immediately, the Sheriff's Department opened an investigation into Carrie's death with assistance from the Kendall County Coroner's Office and the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services. The couple's surviving three-year-old daughter was taken into protective custody. Interestingly, late on the evening of July 1st, Carrie's grandmother, Sue, and uncle, C.R., both of whom also lived in the Boulder Hill House, left on a planned vacation to Atlanta. Some people think this detail is suspicious, especially because they left very late at night, but according to others, Sue had been counting down to her departure date for a couple of weeks on Facebook. Also on the evening before Kerrigan was found deceased, neighbor Monica Alexander reportedly heard Carrie outside screaming, but she was taken inside before Monica was able to go out and check on her. Carrie's cause of death was not immediately known. The investigation continued. Meanwhile, on Friday, July 10th, Carrie's funeral was held at Warehouse Church in Aurora, Illinois. CBS 2 later revealed that prior to her death, the Kendall County Sheriff's Department was called to the Boulder Hill House 15 times since the Davidson family moved in the year before. The Davidsons apparently moved out of the Boulder Hill House within days of Carrie's death. Their former landlord told sheriff's officials on July 9th that before the family moved in the year before, the residence had been freshly painted the carpet had been replaced, and one of the bathrooms had been remodeled. A police report from the day of Carrie's death described the environment inside the house as uninhabitable, detailing a foul stench permeating the house, multiple piles of garbage inside the home, as well as dirty diapers and what appeared to be feces on the floors, carpets, and stairs throughout the house. On the floor in the dining area, police found broken eggs, spilled soda, rotting food, and both clean and dirty diapers. 
Roaches were seen on a shelving unit and countertops in the kitchen, and multiple prescription bottles for about 10 different medications were found in the bedrooms. It soon came out that a number of people saw or heard things happening at the Davidson house that concerned them enough to place calls to the police and to DCFS. Monica Alexander, who had made multiple calls to police about her concerns, told a reporter, At least four times. Um, I'd say more, because I know I called anonymously a few times. The police never went inside of their house. When I saw them at the house, my first response was, It's Carrie. I just assumed that she was hurt or she was gone. And then when they didn't take her away, I knew. Shortly after Carrie's death, Monica posted the following on Facebook. This is my neighbor. An innocent six-year-old child lost her life. She was the same age as my daughter. She just finished kindergarten. She loved to play outside with her dog, sister, and friends. She loved to color with chalk, talk to my girls, and share in our cookouts and s'mores. We often passed food, chalk, or toys to them over the fence. Despite the environment she lived in, she was still a sweet little girl. I have personally called the police on several occasions to report abuse and neglect when they were playing outside naked in the snow, but don't worry, the cops told them to go inside and put on coats, when they were screaming nonstop so loudly that I could hear it inside my home, but don't worry, the cops said the kids were being bad so they were locked in a room, when they were playing with fireworks that are illegal for adults to use in Illinois without any adults present, but don't worry, the cops sat in his car until they stopped, no need to check on the kids there, when the mother yanked a tricycle out from underneath Carrie, slamming her whole body head first onto the concrete in front of my home. But don't worry, the mom told the cop Carrie was okay, so they left. Other neighbors have also called the police. Nothing has happened. Those kids have been taking care of themselves, with no adult supervision most of the time. But when there are adults present, they are screaming and cussing at them, or physically hurting the children. These kids were two and five when they moved in, going through life this way. It broke my heart to watch this and not be able to do anything. People in the neighborhood groups mocked the scanner calls for well-being checks. They said people shouldn't be so nosy. I guess I should have been more nosy. My girls don't know yet. I don't know how to tell them. How do you tell two little girls that their friend has died? How do you tell them that her parents likely murdered her? I don't know how to do it. What I do know is something needs to be done. The other children need to be placed in protective care. DCFS and the Kendall County Police Department need to be investigated for their lack of action. This is unacceptable. No one ever followed up with me from DCFS. My heart is broken. This should not happen. There has to be a way to protect children from their parents. In another post, Monica said, Friends, family, neighbors, Carrie's doctor, teachers, and even strangers driving past their Boulder Hill home reported the family to the Kendall County Sheriff's Office and DCFS but no one saved her. It seems even many of their family members ignored or excused the mistreatment. Courtney's mother and brother lived in the same home. How did they witness the abuse, neglect, and deplorable living conditions those children suffered and do nothing? Why is Sue or Rutherford walking free when she contributed to the dysfunctional home that led to Carrie's death? It seems that instead of demanding justice, many in the family are trying to protect those who fail to provide first-hand information to authorities that could have saved Carrie. Anyone who contributed to the circumstances leading to her death should face justice for their actions, or more likely, inaction. Through the just past year, the neighbor living next door to the home they were renting witnessed a life that no child should have to suffer through. She reported abuse and neglect on multiple occasions for instances such as the girls playing naked or in diapers, Yes, six-year-old Carrie wore diapers despite her apparently normal mental abilities for her age. Courtney slamming Carrie on the concrete and leaving her there crying and alone. Witnessing the girls play with illegal fireworks with no adults outside. Seeing the girls playing in a busy street. And hearing J.D. piercingly screaming for a heartbreakingly long time. Never once did the police investigate inside the home or spend more than a couple of minutes talking to the parents. When responding to the calls, the officers explained that DCFS had a huge file on them, the Davidsons, and that the caseworker would be contacting witnesses. That worried neighbor never got a call from the caseworker, despite calling DCFS herself. A neighbor named Debbie told CBS2, My family has called the police to check on those kids at times. So I, I was scared for those kids. There's a six-year-old child that no longer has a life. 
another neighbor said in a Facebook comment. I lived behind the family. I just moved in this year in April. In the short time being here, I had a feeling life was not safe over there. I did pay attention just in case. I saw Kerrigan outside sometimes. She appeared to be adorable, happy little girl. I was in my yard on Father's Day and saw the adults fighting. Kerrigan said if you don't stop, the neighbors will call the cops. According to CBS2, one of Carrie's teachers also reached out to DCFS at one point with concerns about the little girl's well-being. According to a DCFS spokesperson, the agency did have contact with the Davidson family, dating as far back as December of 2015, when DCFS investigated a report of alleged abuse or neglect. After that, there were six more investigations into similar allegations that took place from 2017 through this year. According to the Chicago Tribune, the case was being treated as an intact family case, and an outside firm hired by DCFS provided intact family services to the Davidsons and their daughter. In such cases, DCFS provides services to a family to prevent further neglect or abuse, but does not remove the child from the household. We know all too well from the stories of A.J. Friend and James Beale, among others, that Illinois DCFS needs a massive overhaul, more accurately a total gutting and restructuring, and Carrie's is another story to add to the list of reasons why that fact cannot be argued. Illinois DCFS has long been riddled with issues, including overwhelming caseloads for caseworkers and a revolving door for leadership. Since 2003, the agency has been overseen by 15 directors or interim directors, which the Chicago Tribune pointed out is a rate of a new director almost every year. Also, as I mentioned in a previous blog post, AJ's case has shone a glaring spotlight on the catastrophic failure of DCFS in the state. The Illinois Department of Children and Family Services Inspector General's annual report from 2019 reveals an utterly shocking statistic. 123 children who had contact with DCFS between July 1, 2018 and June 30, 2019 died within 12 months of that contact. In AJ's case, two former DCFS employees were recently arrested, each of them charged with two felony counts of endangering the life of a child and one felony count of reckless conduct. Carlos Acosta and Andrew Pollivan stand accused of failing to act, falsifying reports, and allowing their laziness and apathy to culminate in the brutal beating death of five-year-old AJ at the hands of his mother, who has been sentenced to 35 years in prison. AJ's father, who admitted to burying his son's body in a shallow grave after the fact, was sentenced last week to 30 years in prison. Dr. Kristen Escobar Alvarenga of the Kendall County Coroner's Office conducted an autopsy on the day of Carrie's death, including a number of toxicological tests, the results of which took several weeks to return. According to the autopsy report, which has been released to the public, Carrie's body arrived at the coroner's office in a body bag clothed in a disposable diaper that is urine-soaked and has moderate amount of fecal matter. No additional clothing is received with the body. Potato chip crumbs are scattered on the lower extremities and within the body bag. Her body showed no signs of injury other than a small bruise on her right leg. Cerebral edema, or a buildup of fluid around the brain that causes an increase in intracranial pressure, was noted. Dr. Alvarenga noted in the autopsy report, The scalp hair is red, short, and straight. The results of the toxicology tests, combined with information obtained during the investigation, led Kendall County Coroner Jackie Purcell to rule the little girl's death a homicide caused by prescription drug toxicity. Carrie had ingested a lethal dose of olanzapine, better known under the brand name Zyprexa, which is an antipsychotic drug commonly prescribed to treat schizophrenia or bipolar mania in patients aged 13 or older. The drug had been prescribed to Courtney, who had previously been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. In Carrie's blood, lab results revealed 720 nanograms per milliliter, which indicates nearly 10 times the maximum recommended dosage for treating an acute psychotic episode, which would be around 20 to 80 nanograms per milliliter. The recommended dosage for regular treatment of schizophrenia and bipolar mania is 5 to 10 milligrams daily. One possible side effect of olanzapine is heart complications. Carrie's autopsy revealed left ventricular hypertrophy, which means there was some thickening of the walls of her heart's main pumping chamber. Like a lot of people, I wonder if Carrie received the medication for an extended period of time. Another common side effect of olanzapine, as well as other antipsychotic medications, is substantial weight gain. 
For the first year or two of her life, Carrie appeared to be within the normal weight range for a child her age, but by the age of six, while she was both beautiful and adorable, she was also undeniably overweight, at 4.5 feet tall and 160 pounds. Regardless of the reason for this, 160 pounds is nearly four times the average weight of a girl her age, which is around 44 pounds. Meanwhile, over the past few years, based on photographs and jail records, it appears Courtney shed a significant amount of weight. A photo taken in November of 2016 after her second child was born depicts a woman who is clearly overweight, if not obese. However, her inmate profile on the Kendall County Sheriff's Office website currently has her listed at a mere 80 pounds, which is literally half what her six-year-old daughter weighed at the time of her death. Could Courtney's weight loss and Carrie's simultaneous weight gain have something to do with the illicit transfer of prescription medication? That's only speculation on my part, but I can't help wondering. Some Facebook commenters have suggested that Courtney's weight loss may have resulted from an autoimmune disease from which she is said to suffer. This could also have been the reason for her earlier hospitalizations. There are no reports of Kerrigan being diagnosed with any type of mental illness or behavioral issues, and even if there were, olanzapine is not generally prescribed to children under 13. Even if Carrie actually did need medication for some undiagnosed behavioral or mood disorder, she should have been taken to a doctor and received an appropriate diagnosis and prescription. Some atypical antipsychotics, such as Abilify, can be prescribed to children as young as Carrie. Abilify is technically indicated for children 10 and up, but depending on the child and severity of symptoms, some doctors are willing to go off-label in some cases. Abilify can also cause weight gain, but as with every medication, the side effects have to be weighed against the benefits. Now here comes the part that caused an uproar amongst a few diehard followers of this case. Olanzapine comes in two forms, standard tablets and orally disintegrating tablets, although it has not been specified in which form Carrie consumed the fatal dose of the drug. On the consumer information leaflet for brand name Zyprexa, the inactive ingredients in the orally disintegrating tablets include aspartame, an artificial sweetener, and mannitol, a sugar alcohol also used as a sweetener. I reached out to a local pharmacy where the pharmacist informed me that olanzapine orally disintegrating tablets are both sweet and, depending on the manufacturer, flavored. The only reason I brought this up in my blog post in the first place is because I have seen multiple comments in the Facebook groups dedicated to Kerrigan insisting there was no way Carrie could have ingested such a high dosage of the medication of her own accord. However, and I stand by this as a perfectly reasonable suggestion, it is absolutely possible Carrie consumed the pills herself, specifically if the form of medication readily accessible to her was sweet and tasty and melted easily in her mouth. Carrie was only six years old. She could very well have thought the pills were candy, especially if an adult had tricked her in the past into taking one, saying something like, Here, eat this, it's candy. That would be a very dangerous thing to do for any parent, leading a child to consider extremely serious medication harmless, but I wouldn't put it past this family of half-wits. Please take note, I'm not stating as fact that Carrie consumed the fatal dose of medication on her own. How she got the drugs in her system is unknown, and without a witness coming forward, we may never know for sure. I'm simply saying it is a possibility, depending on the form of olanzapine, Courtney had been prescribed and dispensed. Regardless of who put the pills in Carrie's mouth, and I can't stress this enough, her mother and stepfather are responsible for her death. As parents, they had a duty to keep any and all harmful substances out of the reach of the two children in their care. For quite a while in my house, every medication stronger than Tums was kept in a locked filing cabinet, the key hidden where only I could find it. There was no way in hell my kids were getting their hands on anything that could potentially harm them, whether it be prescription medication or Tylenol. Whether or not Carrie did ingest the tablets on her own, Courtney and James Davidson utterly failed Kerrigan in their responsibility to protect her, and it cost that precious little girl her life. My suggestion about the possibility of Carrie ingesting the pills herself is what sent some followers of the case into a blind rage. It seems that a few people are firmly entrenched in their belief that Courtney and James forced the olanzapine down Carrie's throat, and anything that might suggest otherwise, no matter how reasonable, sends them into a frenzy. While I was being attacked by a member of the Justice for Carrie Facebook group, she outright banned me from the Her Name is Kerrigan Rutherford group, where I hadn't even had a chance to look at the comments on my post, let alone reply to them. The admins of that group said they gave me 24 hours to respond, which was a flat-out lie because it happened while I was responding to the other page's comments. 
Meanwhile, even though I wasn't there to defend myself, they continued posting snarky comments and insults about me in their group, even suggesting other members should leave negative reviews on my Facebook page. Okay, bullshit. No, it's not bullshit. Bullshit. Okay? No, it's not bullshit, bullshit. Nancy. No, you. You're bullshit. I've gotten into social media squabbles before about stories I've covered, but this is above and beyond. I tried not to take their negativity to heart, but I've ended up with more than one migraine over it, and my blood pressure shot through the roof a couple times. I know not everyone is going to agree with everything I write or say. Being disliked by some comes with the territory, because I'm picking apart the lives of the people accused of committing horrific crimes against children. But this? This is ridiculous. These people accused me of victim-blaming, which I absolutely did not do. They tried to ruin my reputation on Facebook because I dared to suggest an innocent child might have inadvertently consumed a lethal dose of a dangerous medication because it tasted sweet, which I unequivocally stated was still her parents' responsibility. They explicitly posted in their group telling others to pile on with the negative reviews. One woman said she was going to warn the admins of other true crime groups about me and my, and I quote, piss-poor penmanship. Listen, lady, I've got plenty of flaws, but piss-poor penmanship is not one of them. If any of these people would like to create a blog and a podcast, cover as many stories as I've covered with as much attention to detail as I have, religiously follow these stories for updates, and devote as many hours of their lives to doing this as I have over the past year and a half, then they can come to me with their insults and accusations. This is bullshit. Thank you to everyone who came to my defense and wrote positive reviews. There were a lot more of you than there were of them. I hope I've made it clear how much I appreciate all of my readers and listeners who understand what I'm trying to do here. Making these children's voices heard and raising awareness of their stories is the most important thing to me. That is my only agenda. On August 6, 2020, 29-year-old James Davidson and 32-year-old Courtney Davidson were arrested at the residence where they had recently moved which, according to a law enforcement officer speaking on condition of anonymity, was a converted hotel populated by transients located in the 800 block of Washington Street in Mendota, Illinois. Each was charged with one count of involuntary manslaughter and two counts of endangering the life or health of a child, all Class three felonies. Court documents allege that James and Courtney unintentionally and recklessly performed acts which were likely to cause death or great bodily harm to Carrie by giving her enough olanzapine tablets to cause her death. They were booked into the Kendall County Public Safety Center. Courtney's bug-eyed appearance in her mugshot and other recent photos may also be the result of her possible autoimmune disease. I'll include it in the Facebook photo album for this episode, but prepare yourself before you look at it. It is legitimately startling. Many people online have decried the charges pressed for being too lenient, but as I've said before on the blog and the podcast, prosecutors file the maximum charges for which they believe they can get a conviction. There is nowhere near enough evidence based on what has been released so far to prove that Courtney and James deliberately murdered Carrie. Unless one of them confesses or someone else who lived in the house, such as Courtney's mother or brother, comes forward with such damning information, involuntary manslaughter is likely the most severe charge we can expect for these two. In court the day after their arrests, Judge Jody Gleason set bail for each defendant at $250,000, which means each would have to pay a $25,000 bond to be released. At a bond hearing on August 7th, First Assistant State's Attorney for Kendall County, Mark Schlifka, said that both Courtney and James Davidson attempted to dodge responsibility for Carrie's death, adding that the two weren't as forthcoming as they should have been when questioned by law enforcement about what happened. He said the prescription medication found in Carrie's system was not intended for her or for any child at all. Judge Gleason ruled that neither of the Davidsons was allowed contact with any child 18 years of age or younger, although she did grant Courtney supervised visits with three-year-old J.D. James was granted Zoom video visits with J.D., who was referenced in court on that date as his stepchild. Later, Kendall County State's Attorney Eric Weiss confirmed that James Davidson is indeed J.D.'s biological father. Courtney and James were both initially represented by Kendall County Public Defender Victoria Chuffo, although at a later hearing, Kendall County Assistant Public Defender Courtney Transier took over Courtney Davidson's representation. On August 12th, Kendall County Chief Judge Robert Pilmer denied the defendants' motions to reduce their bail amounts to $25,000 each, which would then allow family members to post the required bond of $2,500 each. 
Transier's motion for bond reduction claimed that Courtney was only receiving half of her usual medications in jail and that Courtney's mother, Sue Orr Rutherford, said Courtney had been in a manic episode since Carrie's death. Transier added that Courtney needs an evaluation and possible hospitalization upon her release from jail. Judge Pilmer was not moved by these claims. He wrote in court documents on August 12th that bond conditions for both James and Courtney had been modified to include no further contact with J.D. until further notice from the court and juvenile court. This modification, coincidentally or not, occurred after Carrie's autopsy and toxicology reports were released. On September 9th, James and Courtney, who recently turned 33 behind bars, appeared in court via video conference, during which both pleaded not guilty to the charges against them. They now await a jury trial. It is unclear if they'll be tried together or separately. Courtney and James, both of whom remain imprisoned in the Kendall County Public Safety Center, are next scheduled to be seen in court at 9 a.m. on November 2, 2020. If convicted of all of the charges against them and their sentences run consecutively, each could face a maximum of 34 years in prison. Now let's take a minute to talk about what really matters here, Carrie. Kerrigan Michael Rutherford liked the colors pink and purple and loved wearing dresses, and she was, by all accounts, an excellent big sister. According to Carrie's obituary, she was a kindergartner at Boulder Hill Elementary at the time of her death. She was a very active princess who loved Barbies, playing outside, slime, and tigers. She enjoyed bubble baths, swimming, mermaids, and unicorns. Carrie also liked to watch YouTube videos and was a huge fan of Jojo Siwa. In a GoFundMe campaign, Carrie's Auntie Trisha wrote, Carrie was a bundle of joy and fun with a huge imagination and love for everyone she met. She loved playing with Barbies, going to school, having her hair done with big bows like Jojo Siwa, and giving lots of hugs. She lit up every room she was in and was such a goofball. Carrie sounds like an adorable, sweet, absolutely perfect six-year-old girl, other than the tragic circumstances surrounding both her life and her death. I would love nothing more than to be able to wrap that little girl in my arms and give her a great big hug. I'm heartbroken that although multiple people attempted to intervene, DCFS failed to step in and save her life. It's inexcusable that they never followed up with this family, which was clearly a train wreck waiting to happen. Carrie deserved so much better. Rest in peace, princess. That's it for this week, guys. Join me next week for another case. If you like the show, please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. And please subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to sufferthelittlechildren.pod at gmail.com. You can also subscribe on YouTube by searching Suffer the Little Children Podcast. Visit the website at www.sufferthelittlechildrenpod.com where you can listen to episodes and become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to exclusive gifts. Follow the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest at Suffer the Little Children Pod and on Twitter at STLCPod. View photos related to today's case on Facebook and Instagram. Read more about today's case and many others at sufferthelittlechildrenblog.com. This podcast was written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. Intro theme music is by Dream Note Music. Other music and sound effects for the show were created using sounds from audiojungle.net. Hug your babies a bit closer tonight. Until next week, bye guys. <laughs>